Welcome to On Contact. Today we discuss the irrevocable decline of the American empire with poet and author Lin Din. We are really the poorest country on earth. People don't refuse to see that. You know, we only surviving, we only looking good because of our military might because we are an empire. But this force cannot go, go on forever. On Contact with Chris Hedges. When we look back, on this sad, pathetic period in American history, we will ask the questions all who have slid into despotism ask. Why were we asleep? Why did we allow this to happen? Why didn't we see it coming? Why didn't we resist? Why did we allow the corporate state to strip away the rights of poor people of color and force them to live in terror in many police states? Why did we permit corporations to de-industrialize our nation and thrust the working class into poverty? Why did we swallow the absurdity of neoliberal ideology that told us the dictates of the marketplace and Wall Street should govern every aspect of our society? Why did the press and the academy stand mute as money replaced the vote and lobbyists authored our laws? Why did they render the poor and the working poor invisible? RT correspondent Anya Parampel looks at the plight of over half the country living in poverty. In his 1961 inaugural address, John F. Kennedy declared, the world is very different now, for man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. Over five decades later, that power to abolish human poverty has not been harnessed in the United States. According to the Social Security Administration, as of 2015, half of the American population made $30,000 a year or less. Working a 40-hour work week, that comes to a wage of about $14.42 an hour. According to the Alliance for Just Society, a living wage in the U.S. would be more like $16.87 an hour. And that's just to afford the basics. And while poverty doesn't discriminate, it does impact some groups of people more than others. According to Poverty USA, as of 2015, 14.8% of American women live in poverty, compared with 12.2% of men. 14.9% of single dads are in dire straits, while a whopping 28.2% of single moms live below the poverty threshold. As you can imagine, this means children are impacted most. In 2015, 19.7% of American children, that's one out of every five, lived in conditions of poverty. The National Center on Family Homelessness found in 2013 that 2.5 million children experienced homelessness at some point during the year. That's one in every 30 children in the U.S. But it's not just children, the elderly suffer as well, with the senior poverty rate weighing in at 13.7%. Overall, black Americans have the highest poverty rate at 24.1%, with Hispanics making up the second poorest demographic. 11.4% of Asians live in poverty, while whites have the lowest rate at 9%. While we may as a society have the resources and tools to alleviate the suffering of these people, as Kennedy believed, for nearly half of the population, just making enough money to survive is a struggle. Thank you, Anya. Lin Din is author of Postcards from the End of America. In the book, he lifts up the voices of those who've been disappeared by our corporate state, the homeless in tent cities, the elderly and sick, those working 70 hours a week, barely able to survive, and those struggling with the violence, addictions, despair, and abuse that always comes with chronic poverty. He chronicles from city to city in graphic and moving detail the accelerating collapse of the United States and its tragic human cost. Thank you. So the power of this book is that you both give voice and a visual, I think, not only through your photographs, but through your brilliant writing. You take half of this country, which has been rendered invisible, and make them visible. Um, and I think in doing that, you expose what's happening within the American empire. If there's a common thread in terms of you know, the, the cities that you go to, the experiences that you write about, the lives that you chronicle, what is it? Um. 
Well, I would say it's more than half. I think the, may, the majority may, right. of the people in this country are living the lives I've described in my book. And I'm always surprised by how um, astounded some readers get by my depictions because they say, well, these are the down and outs, these right. are the low lives, these are who are these people? These are the people I've known all my lives. Right. You know, so the commonality that I see is this growing despair and a uh, degree of anger. And so it gives lies to the, uh, the false narrative that we're in a recovery, that we're doing so right. well. We're not doing well at all. Describe a little bit about, we were talking before on air about Barbara Ehrenreich describing the life of the poor as one long emergency, that kind of stress, which is a kind of common theme throughout the lives that you chronicle. Describe a little bit about you know, what the emotional state both the economic and emotional state of the people you write about? Well, um, even when things were relatively uh, going well, uh, these lives were very difficult, you know, because I was a house painter, I was a house cleaner. Uh, I worked with these people. I mean, it wasn't like an experiment. I mean, I had to do these jobs, right. and I could barely believe how difficult it was to get by Just day to day. physically. Physically, and, and mentally and spiritually. Mm -hmm. So it has got only gotten harder because the anxiety and the stress of losing your job or not being able to perform your job daily is, is astounding. And, uh, and I would say it affects the majority, uh, a majority of Americans right now. So, uh, and it's, it's go only going to get worse, you know, but you, you can't see it from a, a privileged place like, say, Manhattan right. or the well, Bay you Area. You can't see it. The, the, the corporate media doesn't reflect this reality either. And, but see, the thing is, whenever they talk about unemployment figures or uh, the state of the economy, uh, you read the comments, okay, you know, uh, and the comments, uh, people howling and cursing the, the article, but, but uh, so most people know that these articles are just nonsense. Right. But, uh, you know, if, if you're not threatened, you know, uh, with your livelihood, you will tend to believe these articles, you know. Uh, I think there's an intellectual class, people who read uh, you, for example, or me, for example, you know, read alternative news. We're not talking about CNN or Fox News. We're talking about even alter alternative media. Even the people who read alternative media don't know how bad it is. Well, you got to go. The only, only way to know is to do what you did, which is go there. Yeah. That's it. And right. most people don't go there. Even people whose sympathies might be with the underclass don't go. And, the, and you know, what's more disturbing, there's a hatred of these people. Yeah. You that's know? right. That, that's okay. very right. Uh, I think on the left, uh, the left always pretend to talk about uh, the masses, the working class, but it really hates the working yeah, class. It does. You know, because uh, it doesn't pay any attention to working class, and it 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 it, uh, it mocks their values. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, it mocks them. It, mo it it ridicules them. It makes fun of them as irredeemable racists, as bigots, as uneducated. And 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 they not <laughs> they not. I mean. Uh, be, you know, these, these people are not alien to me. I've been around s s the so-called underclass my whole life because I'm a part of the underclass, okay? Uh, I mean, I may not look this way now because I have my funeral and wedding suit on, but, you know, day to day, I, these, are, these are my people, okay? So I'm just saying uh, they know how to accommodate other people, other races, other ethnic groups because they have to deal with that daily, okay? The underclass has no... Uh, 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 no means of withdrawing into the enclave, you know. They have to take the bus, they have to take the train, they have to drink at bars, uh, uh, mix with, you know, all kinds of different types of people. So the underclass is actually less racist than, than the educated class, in, in my experience, you know, because they're less condescending to me, in my experience. To what extent, you came to the United States at the age of 11, is that correct, from Vietnam as a refugee? In, in a sense, I, mean, I think all of the great, brilliant chroniclers of any society are kind of one step removed, outsiders, people like W.E. Du Bois or James Baldwin. To what extent does that separation allow you to see things that perhaps those of us who are native to the United States, well, I mean, after displacing indigenous people, are, are unable to see? Well, um, yes, I mean, I'm an outsider I mean, because, because I, I arrived here as an immigrant. Uh, I write in English, well, which is were, not my name. I mean, we should, you were a refugee. I was a refugee, too. I mean, you were living in tents, like yes. Syrians. Sh sure. And, you know, I was in, uh, living in tents in Guam and living in army barracks in Arkansas. And, uh, 
you know, I'm also writing in a language not my own. Okay, so of course I'm a, I'm an outsider, but that's that's fine. I used to, that used to disturb me. I used to uh. try to figure out a way to wiggle in, but I realized it's hopeless because I'm not uh, part of the you know any kind of mainstream, which is fine because then I realized a lot of Americans are not part of the mainstream either. Right. You know, including white Americans. So I don't draw this boundary, this distinction between say uh, people of color, so to speak, and 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 white Americans because a lot of white Americans are also alienated and also uh, excluded from any participation in this economy, in this culture, in any meaningful way. I want to read a passage from your book. Along with the visible decay that can be seen in cities and small towns alike, there is a widespread malaise afflicting the American spirit. And this is most acutely felt among the younger set. If they have gone to college, then they are most likely crippled with insane debt while stuck in a job that doesn't require their overpriced it diluted education, acquired with bankster loans. To make ends meet, they're living in a crowded shared apartment or a home with mom and dad again. As for the professions, many are rotten with fraud, corruption, and other immoralities. What a quaint word. So that to hold even the lowliest job in the military, police, government, banking, accounting, insurance, healthcare, media, advertising, or the academy, etc., is to swim among crooks and liars and it's all too easy to become a cynical and sinister asshole yourself. But you're writing about the emerging generation here. And what is that doing to this next generation? Because per perhaps unlike their parents, they, from the beginning, don't buy the American dream. Yes, because they, they pay too much for college and they're in debt for life. And basically, I'm describing the Occupy uh, crowd, the people who, 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 uh, who populate all these Occupy uh, encampments across the country. Uh, and those are the same people who are, who are on the streets now protesting Trump. Right. Okay, so I mean, I, I can see the anger and the frustration, but I think they've been um, misdirected because with the Occupy movement, uh, it started out with a very clear focus which was the, the bankers is the source of the problem and then it became all over the place right okay and because it was all over the place it had no uh, clear agenda it alienated the people it should have uh, you know enlisted uh, you know in, into you know into the movement so uh, yet the growing frustration the growing despair of growing up without a future is something I see a lot, you know, with the younger generation. We'll come back to that after this break. Thanks. We'll take a short break. When we return, we'll hear more from Lynn Din, author of Postcards from the End of America. Feeling of freedom. Everyone in the world should experience freedom, and you get it on the open road. The world according to Jesse. Welcome to my world. Come along for the ride. I'm Governor Jesse Ventura, and you're watching RT America. Question more. Here's what people have been saying about Redacted tonight. Give it to us. Redacted is full on awesome. Really? The only show I go out of my way to watch every week. Exclusive. It really packs a punch. Wow. Lee Camp is the John Oliver of RT America. They do have the same accent. Hey, we are apparently better than boobs. Nothing's better than boobs. You see, people you've never heard of love Redacted tonight. The president of the World Bank, though, hates it. Seriously, he sent us an email. What did you have for breakfast yesterday? Why would you pick those shoes? How fast is your Wi-Fi? What's your dog's name? Why'd you name him that? What's your biggest fear in life? Ever been on a hayride? When's the last time you read a book? What would you say if you ever met the Pope? Who's the best quarterback of all time? What's one topping that doesn't belong on a pizza? Now, I've interviewed you too. Ah. Question more. About your sudden passing, I've only just learned. You wore yourself thin, taking your last wrong turn. 
Your act caught up to you as we all knew it would. I'd tell you I'm sorry, if only I could. So I write these last words in hopes to put to rest these things that I never got off my chest. I remember when we first met, my life turned on each breath. But then my feelings started to change. You talked about war like it was a game. Still some were fond of you, those that didn't like to question or argue. And I secretly promised to never be like you. It's said one does not leave a funeral the same as one enters. The mind gets consumed with death, but this one quite differs. I speak to you now because there were no other takers. To proclaim that mainstream media has met its maker. On Contact with Chris Hedges. Welcome back to On Contact. We'll continue our conversation with Lynn Din, author of Postcards from the End of America. So is this frustration, rage, the, the force that Trump tapped into? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Although I, I, uh, I see him as a fraud, as a con man. Right. Uh, I don't dismiss uh, the people who support him because I can see his appeal to all these people. Um, you know, it's unfortunate that they are being... Uh, uh, the, you know, they deposited it, they hope onto this, this, this farce, you right. know. Uh, in a way, I see him as, as similar to Obama. Obama was used to appease a certain segment of the population. So Trump is used to uh, pacify uh, the working class, and the, specifically the white working class, middle America, you know. To, to, uh, and he's also used to provide a target, a convenient target, a scapegoat for the left. Right. You know, so in the end, Trump is not, uh, he's not the decider, okay? I, I really don't see him as making any real decisions. Uh, so uh, I actually uh, wrote about this before he became president. I predicted he was going to win. You know, I said, you know, this, he is so useful for, for the elite in the sense that, you know, he's providing false hope to uh, half the country and, and providing a convenient target to the other half. So, you know, he's very useful for, for the ruling class. Do you expect that at a certain point that segment of the population that supported him will realize they've been betrayed? Well, see, here's a funny thing. I think some of them already know, uh, they already know that they're being conned. Okay, but what happened with Obama? Obama did not change any, uh, uh, you know, Obama was supposed to overturn the Bush fiasco, but he continued a lot of the policies of, of, of George Bush, right. and yet he was reelected. So I realized that when, once people have de decided they're going to support a, an icon, you know, a savior, they're going to double down and keep going with it. Because, you know, so I think that a lot, a lot of Trump supporters are in denial about how much of a fraud he is. You have a very bleak view of where we're headed, I mean, into a kind of Hobbesian universe. And a kind of sub-theme throughout all of your writings is this internal collapse of the American empire, the American state. Um, expl talk a little bit about that, about, about how, where you see us kind of rolling forward. Well, everywhere I go, okay, every, every town I visit, uh, uh, you don't see any industries, right. you don't see any factories, you don't see anything. We don't make anything. So, uh, and we in debt, you know, we, we are really the poorest country on earth, and people don't refuse to see that. You know, we only surviving, we're only looking good because of our military might, because we are an empire. But this force cannot go, go on forever. I mean, uh, it should be so obvious that we only uh, chugging along with accounting fraud, with, with uh, you know, we bullying people into lending us money and sending us stuff that we don't deserve, we haven't earned. So you, you how write, can we survive this? You thing? write at one point that hundreds of thousands of Americans have been reduced to living like savages in this self-proclaimed greatest country on earth. And I think one of the things that you, you see, you live in Philadelphia, North Philadelphia, um, that even those minimum wage jobs where people could barely survive, they're not even there anymore. The, no. Even they're gone. And that's something that you see in your book. They're just, people can't even stock shelves anymore. Yeah. And we're talking about like, working people. Right. Not, you know, I know friends who are working, personal friends who are on food stamp who can barely survive. You know, because uh, while their wages haven't gone up, and actually many, in many instances they've gone down, uh, uh, rents have gone up. 
because there's people, uh, there's a certain class of people who can afford to buy homes, you know, who buy multiple homes and jacking up. You know, here's another thing about uh, immigrants. You know, when people talk about immigrants, they have a, a, a picture of uh, a destitute refugee or destitute, uh, you know, a third world immigrant. But a lot of the rich from these other countries are moving in too. Uh, in the Bay Area. You write about at the end with San Francisco. That yes. The Chinese millionaire, billionaire class coming in and buying up the real estate. Right. So let's let's rethink this open borders uh, proposal for a second. You know, so you have the rich coming in and making rent unaffordable for many poor Americans, including other immigrants. You know, so, so you know, I have personal friends who can barely eat right now. Right. What do you see is happening? What do you, what do you, where do you think we're going to go? Um. I know you've been talking about uh, like a potential revolution from the left. You know. Well, that's a hope. That's I think the hope. revolution will probably be fascist, but uh, yeah. Okay, so well, the fascist revolution is a counter revolution, but right. let's let's don't even call it a fascist revolution. Let's just call it a counter some kind of counter revolution. Right. So, I I'm not sure that will happen because I mean the Occupy movement was bigger than the anti-Trump movement, and nothing came of that. Right. Right. So you have all these seething. Middle Americans who are not on the streets, the, the so called Trump supporters, uh, you know, they have their guns, they have their, you know, but I, I, I'm, I think the government is going to use this internal conflict to become even more of a police state, and that's something you point out all right. along. So I think that's part of the plan. But, they but want to divide us so they can. But talk a little bit about what that, you know, how we're going to be reduced to living. I mean, what's, what are our lives going to look like? Uh, Increasing poverty. I, I don't see any, any way around that. You know, I think very soon, perhaps within this year, <laughs> Americans are going to discover how poor they really are. I mean, many of my friends are already, you know, barely surviving. So, uh, uh, you know, and so this is like a mirage. You know, we're sitting in midtown Manhattan. You know, uh, right. th this is not going to last. I don't see it lasting because we ha there's no foundation. You know, we're not making anything. And Trump's not going to make America great again. He's not going to bring the foundation. So, what's that going to look like? I mean, I mean, you're, you, you talk about. A, a kind of a, almost clannish uh, antagonisms. I mean, the, the, that in the breakdown of the country you you see coming, a ratcheting up of violence, a ratcheting up of racial conflicts. Well, um, a researcher on nationalism, that's for sure. Which is racist. Uh, not necessarily, because I mean, would you call Vietnamese nationalism racist or Palestinian nationalism racist? Well, I call racism? any kind of nationalism that celebrates exceptionalism, which at least our version as yeah. racist, yeah. because you, by elevating yourself, there's no kind of equality. You are immediately creating a hierarchy. Okay. How, how about we we re uh, phrase this to call it uh, a kind of uh, regionalism? You know, oh. an attachment to to place. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, and maybe uh, an attachment to the status quo as is. You know, I'm like, like okay, let's say we, we cool with a certain percentage of white, certain percentage of black, certain percentage of Asian, but let's not disrupt this. Let's not cause too much more upheaval. Uh, I, I think I'm going to, I mean, I already see that happening. And you, you talk about coming back from uh, Eastern Europe, and you, you see that in Eastern Europe. Yeah. You know, so uh, I think people will have a better sense of. Uh, community in a sense that we want our community to stay put. We don't want any more disruption because there's been so much upheaval. And you know, I, I know it's a paradox for me as an immigrant to talk about this. I'm not defending it. I'm just, I'm just telling you what I see, okay? Uh, uh, a kind of in, uh, retrenchment of, of uh, regionalism. You know, like, you know, we don't, uh, multiculturalism is over. I really right. think it's over because uh, if you're living in Manhattan, multiculturalism just means choices. Right. Choices right. of places to eat, right. choices right. of, uh, you know, babysitters. Right. But if you aren't at the bottom, you know, when you have outsiders coming in all the time, it just causes so much tension and so much conflict and so much competition, you know, uh, people have had enough of it. And I know it sounds very pessimistic, and like I say, you know, for an immigrant to say that sounds very bizarre, but that's what I see. What gives you hope? What, what sustains you? Uh, or maybe you're sustained by anger, which isn't bad. No, no. <laughs> I, what gives me hope is that I think people, when they have direct contact with each other, uh, and you know, most people have no, you know, there's deep alienation in my book. You yeah, know? you write at one point, like television, the private automobile was invented to wean us off our own humanity. From each, we've learned how to amp up 
our impatience and indifference towards everything and with life itself. Anything that's seen through a screen or windshield becomes ephemera, with its death nearly instant. You don't have to switch channels or run over it. It will disappear by itself. All screens and windshields have been erected to block us from intercourse. You've talked about the same thing, about, about, about the tyranny of the image. Yeah. Okay, so uh, people hardly know where they are. You know, they can be in Osceola, they could right. be in Jackson. And but it all looks the same. They all look the same because they're all looking at the screen. Okay, so. Well, but also the strip, I mean, I, I, I did a book on the Christian rights. So I was going around to, you know, lower income cities all. And I, I, I was moving from city to city, as you did, and I sometimes forget, am I in Detroit or am I in Cleveland? I didn't, because you're just one long Burger King and, uh, yeah, you, you can't even yeah. tell where you are. People can be sitting across from each other and, and not see each other. That, that's across the country. So my hope is that as this uh, system breaks down, you know, the sooner the better for me, actually, people can rediscover each other's humanity, you know, and they can deal with their neighbors. And I think people are actually very accommodating. You know, uh, they know how to, you know, uh, uh, to respect each other. And, and I don't see that uh, at the moment because, you know, they've been uh, bombarded by nonsense from elsewhere, you know, uh, by, by media centers that are, have nothing to do with their, their, their own lives. I just want to end by reading the end of your book because it kind of symbolizes what you've done with your brilliant writing and reporting. Stories make a place. Without stories, there is no place. But without place, there can still be stories. If your stories are not organically grown, but imposed on you by those who hate everything about you, then you're virtually dead. After the last Centralian, this is a town destroyed by coal mining, has come home to be buried. You talk about how it's an empty town and people just come back to, in, to be put in the graveyard. The town will be just its cemeteries and a section of lost road. Buckled and cracked, it's filled with graffiti, much of it erotically inspired. Um, in a way, what, what you're doing is telling these stories before many of them disappear. And that's a kind of an attempt, I think, to kind of recover before it's eviscerated the, the humanity of the places you write about and the people you write about. I actually think um, whatever observations I've been able to make uh, will become more obvious. We, you know, each passing year. So this book will become, uh, uh, you know, right now, some people might see it's outlandish, like, what are, what are you saying? But I think, it'll be, you know, my messages will become so clear with each passing year because this is the future, I, well, I really you, believe. And you nailed it brilliantly. Right, thanks, Chris. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> that was Lynn Din, author of Postcards from the End of America. The failure of our capitalist democracy was collective. It was bred by ignorance, indifference, racism, bigotry, and the seduction of mass propaganda. It was bred by elites, especially in the press, the courts, and academia, who chose careerism over moral and intellectual courage. Our rights as citizens were taken from us one by one. There was hardly a word of protest. America is rapidly devolving into a third world nation run by oligarchs, corporations, and militarized police. Our anemic democracy is being replaced by an authoritarian state led by a demagogue who cares nothing for the rule of law. Tens of millions of people, brutally controlled, already live in perpetual poverty. This is the result of unchecked corporate capitalism. The goal is to make us all serfs on the corporate plantation. Thank you for watching. You can find us on rt.com slash oncontact. See you next week.